Hi, in this short video I will explain how a day on a trading floor works. Here you see a picture to make all we set before in this lecture more hands-on, easier to grasp how the persons behind this work. You see a picture of a trading floor where all the tasks we discussed so far in this video are typically located. These are the people doing it in one example. Here is the trading floor for Trianel when I used to work there, which obviously is a few years back. Now you know I'm a professor of energy economics, uh, but I did this as I said in the introduction of this video myself. Um, and here's a picture of how such a trading floor looked like when I was working there. You see, interestingly, it's a relatively huge room, no cubicles, but a little bit of noise cancellation. And these are um, actually the things you see there are filtering some of the noise, but you want specifically people sitting close together. You want people to sit in one room so that they can interact and it's surprising to see how much information you actually gather just by sitting there, being present, partly uh, directly relating with your colleagues, but partly just sitting there and listening to what's going on around you. You get a feeling for the market. And that's what's important here. You want to know what's going on. And that's another reason why you see so many uh, monitors here. Well, actually four is not that much by now. People always often have six in these departments, maybe even eight. Um, they have different information on the different monitors and in order to be able to follow this information in real time and not always switch between programs, it's easier to have one source of information on one monitor and then just let the eye wander a little bit to get additional new information. So this is how it looks like. Of course, it totally depends on the size of the company, how large, how big this room actually is. The trading floor in large integrated companies is truly spectacular. At banks, it's impressive. Um, essentially, one very important German uh, company built their own building for this function. They essentially built the building around this trading floor. It's the heart of their new building, beautifully showing the significance. And if you enter, there is a large glass wall where you see through down on the trading floor. It really is an impressive sight. Okay, so that's the people working there and that's how the setup works. And just to repeat, this is where the tasks we discussed so far are typically performed. Buying, selling, interacting with the wholesale market, optimizing your generation assets. The market part is happening here. Of course, your marketing division, on the other hand, is working with the client. So they are outside. They are not typically sitting here. It's not necessary that they have this information. They have different tasks. And the back office also is not located here. People doing the risk management, um, actually putting the deals in the end into the systems, paying the money, watching that the money flows accordingly. Uh, they don't have to sit here neither. You are focusing the people who truly need to know what's going on on the market here. That's the people sitting there. Some companies have some analysts sitting there providing information to discuss, uh, but that also depends on the setup of the company. Here you see an overview and a timeline how the 24 days on a trading floor look like. During the workday, starting around maybe 8, people show up, start reading news, analysis of 
fundamentals, how the weather, what's the availability of power plant, and then once you've done that at some point, some later point, you start trading futures if you want to do something, and you nominate flexible contracts, you do a portfolio validation, and then you also do continuous spot trading, you do market forecasts, and so on and so on. At the bottom you see some timelines for different markets, APX is the first to do the day ahead auction, then Nord, Nordpool is doing uh, day ahead single hour auctions, and then APEX Spot for Germany, for example, is doing day ahead auctions. And there is some information, some value to gain from watching these different ones. Then at 2.30 we have already discussed schedule nomination for balancing group responsibilities, and then in the later part you have risk measurement, collateral management, and reporting. Here you have the tasks in a different timeline. You have the derivatives market, which you can trade years before the day of delivery. This slide here is centered on the day of delivery. You have the, the derivatives market, day and weekend futures, week futures, month futures, options, quarter futures, options, year futures, options, which you can trade years before delivery. And then one day before delivery, you do the day ahead auction in hourly contracts. You do the nomination of energy contracts to the TSO and then the intraday auction starts and then continuous trading for contracts for the next day. The intraday market starts with that intraday auction. And then some minutes before delivery the intraday market ends, that is, on the day of delivery. And then you have delivery here, for example, one hour from, or 150 minute interval from 2 p.m. to 2.15, sorry, a.m. this is. Okay, and balancing power goes on trading the whole day. Then on this trading floor, you ask yourself, what's the right price? Where should the price be? Is the price I currently observe too low or too high? Because if you're supposed to make money on these markets, you have to come up with your own assessment on this. So energy prices are in part driven by fundamental factors. So if you want to come up with your own assessment, you have to watch all these energy prices. So, in a way, you have to come up with your own assessment, is the price too low or too high? And one way of doing this is fundamental. And that's essentially what you see here. You see the fundamental factors on the supply side and on the demand side. Yes, this would be a completely different video if you would dive into the details of how they influence the electricity price you see here in the center. But I think Everybody understands that rainfall, storage and run of river power plants, wind and wind farms, CO2 prices, gas prices, oil prices, coal prices, and even uranium prices, and then power plants and grids in terms of revisions, technical defects, on, and so on, on the supply side, all are relevant for the wholesale electricity price. Same on the demand, temperature, influences air conditioning, electric heating on the demand side, clouds, effects lighting and demand, time of day, public holidays, school holidays, influence consumer behavior for both the industry and uh, the household consumers. And then there is other long-term influencing factors, economic changes, cyclical swings, growth, political decisions, phasing out of nuclear, expansion and closure of capacity, uh, that all influences electricity prices. And again, if you're a trader or a portfolio manager interested in spotting the right time to buy or sell something, you have to make up your mind about your future expectations. And it's not enough to just look at the future contract price. You have to evaluate that price is it the right, the best price? Is now the time to sell or do I wait 
is now the time to buy or do I wait? And this is a complex process. Luckily there is some support and you see the support here, news and analysis, facts and psychology. So here in the very early morning professional newsletters are distributed nowadays of course sent out via email and you can look through what professional analysts assessment of the markets is. Here is an example uh, for one such newsletter you can look at the details. Another here is an assessment where regarding psychology traders are asked what's your view on the market and here the traders say this is a bullish day prices are likely to go up but if somebody else tells you a market expectation you should always take it with a grain of salt it's really important you have always to ask yourself what's the interest of these people and imagine you're a trader and then such a newsletter calls you asks you for your market sentiment. You would first of all think about your own position. If you are long betting on rising prices you would say well I expect rising prices there is several reasons why prices should rise and then you hope that people read this follow your assessment and the price then if people start trading on this expectation will rise and then if you're really good you even get a self-fulfilling prophecy but you were the first to buy you already had the long position up front so you bought when it was still cheap so these traders asked here are not neutral of course uh, they don't want to kind of take too much risk with their forecast because then if they prove to be wrong that's also not very good for them so if you say well the price will rise and then essentially what happens price drops uh, then you're actually well in the negative twice first of all you probably had a position expecting that prices would go up which they didn't and second you were quoted prices will go up but now they go down so you are not kind of being perceived as a very very knowledgeable person on this but again, it is your chance if you're asked to influence the sentiment of the market. So if you read this, you should always take precaution that it's not completely neutral. But these psychological facts are an important part of the market, of every market. So once you're fresh out of university and you have learned a lot about how such a market works, supply, demand. We explain here uh, exactly what we saw on the last slide, how fundamental factors uh, lead to an intersection of supply and demand and that can be perceived as where the price, the market price should be. You may be shocked a little bit by how much psychology actually is in the market. And you have to understand and be aware of this. So. A little bit like a good poker player who is not playing your own cards or his or her own cards but also the opponents you have to think about what's the market sentiment what are other people likely to do okay and here these newsletters we are just discussing external sources of information help you to do that then we have analysis reports some companies and Triana at the time I was there had that and I truly enjoyed talking to these smart people. Uh, there was analyst reports internally. That's on the one hand uh, a little bit more limited because the external newsletters if they sell them to 10 people they can invest more in streamlining it because like they are paid by 10 people while your internal analysis department obviously is paid by you and by you only so you bear all the costs but at the same time you reap all the profits and these people maybe are truly neutral they are unbiased so they tell you to the best of their ability ideally at least what their sentiment is and they can also provide reports 
and then they they are just there to make the portfolio managers traders jobs a little bit easier to make them able to take better informed decisions okay so this is also something you as a portfolio manager or a trader read in the early morning hours to be able to when the trading really gets momentum liquidity increases to be able to then already participate and earn money of course one thing i should also say trading is 24 7. most systems with continuous trading for example futures or the forwards are set up in a way where you have uh, continuous trading so theoretically you could trade 24 7 but point is participation is voluntarily we said that so you need a counterparty you need somebody who is also willing to trade so even if you are up at night and want to make a fortune you need somebody else who is also up at night and wants to make a fortune obviously not both of you can make a fortune at the same time it's going to be more likely one of you hopefully it's going to be you but anyhow you have to find the second person and obviously more people regarding any particular market are interested trading in that market during office hours and obviously quite often most of the interest for a region a market are coming from people working in that region so liquidity for German power forwards is highest during the day when people are interested in Germany in trading and selling these contracts so this is not by law not by definition it's just following from the circumstances that liquidity is highest obviously when people want to trade okay so here in the early morning in the example here 7 30 you start to familiarize yourself with what you or what your analysts think is going to happen they help you to come up with your own assessment what you think is going to happen and you being responsible for a client or a book a trading book you are the person who has to decide because you in the end then are benchmarked against the performance of that trading book and then you can use all sorts of market price forecasts to derive your assessment you can use statistics you can use the fundamental approaches but in the end you should work on your trading strategy and if you believe today is a good day to buy you should do so and if you believe today is a good day to sell you should do so and if you think which happens today is a good day to wait you do other things there is no immediate need to act in many of the portfolios for example I as portfolio manager uh, was procuring energy for I didn't have to do a, de a deal every day of course I had to follow the market every day I had several other tasks I was also team leader supervising the rest of the team and uh, in the portfolio it's not only about buying and selling it's also about discussing with the clients and so on and so on so there typically is something to do um, but you don't have to buy or sell every day but it may be that you have to buy on a specific day that's what you see here for example, if we had that portfolio management strategy where you had to buy certain amounts every month or every quarter. And then by the end of the month or by the end of the quarter, you get nervous. You have to do something at the very last, by the last day of that quarter. Then there may be need for action from limit, binding limits with certain customers, certain trading positions. Um, and you also have, may have the profit realization or stop loss limits we also discussed these type of limits so the, the stop loss may be binding depending on what the market does you remember that portfolio management strategy if not go back and watch the procurement portfolio management strategy so that may translate into a need for action something else that needs to be done on the trading floor and I should mention that at this point not necessarily by the same person what I'm describing here as an overview is 
the functionality of a significant part of the trading floor. So it's many different people, many different departments doing this for electricity, for gas. Some people are doing the long-term trading I mentioned. Other people are doing the short-term trading. Uh, we will see on the next slide here. This is more short-term oriented. That's what other people typically do. This is complex process. If you are a large, especially integrated utility, you have a lot of deals on both the buy and the sell side. And you have a lot of consumers on the consumption side and you may even have several generation assets you may be doing this as a service for third parties and it's not that easy to actually determine whether your portfolio is flat or what the portfolio for any given 15 minute interval for the next day is remember by 2.30 you have to be flat your open position for every 15 minute interval of the following day has to be exactly zero. But that's not that simple to come up with. So here is, you do that and then you sell when you're long and you buy when you're short to be able to have the zero open position for all 96 15 minute intervals of the next day. Such a broker screen here you can do buying and selling, but you can also use for information purposes. We have already discussed this. You can use other internet sources, such as for students, because it's for free, I tend to recommend the Good Mode Trader, which has beautiful data on crude oil, which used to be a kind of a lead commodity in all energy markets. Uh, it's starting to get less influence, but it's still important. So here is nearly real-time data for crude oil price developments and you can see it for free. Here is another important tool. This is real-time information from a professional screen. Here it's Reuters as an example. Uh, they are specializing on providing that service with a so-called terminal which costs a lot of money to subscribe to but it's an amazingly valuable tool because Reuters is a company specializing in all this and they have a lot of expertise and they provide that to their subscribers and it's really helpful. Okay, then there is futures trading, choosing the right time. In case of physically justified positions, customer loads, own generation, orientation towards hedging strategy and sufficient margin. And in case of proprietary trading, position strict predefined rules on stop loss and profit realization. So that def defines the right time to do something. And then the decision criteria whether you want to do the physical deal or the financial deal. We have discussed the pros and cons for that, but here is a repetition. Then we have international power exchange between region A and region B. You can do trades, a little bit more just visual ideas here. Uh, if the red curve, the EX price is between Nord Pool or different from Nord Pool, let's put it more general, you can buy and sell. And then we're already in the afternoon. That's post-processing of trades. That's risk management. We will come back to this. This is how to do all the reporting of what has been done during the day. That's typically not the trader doing themselves, but you have to have complex reporting in place. We will discuss this in the next part of the lecture on risk management. So this slide is just meant as a bridge towards next things we will discuss risk management and with that i conclude this chapter on portfolio management thank you all very much for watching